All right. Good day, good afternoon, good however you're trying to do this. Um, I'm going to pre-record this video. Um, told you guys about that prior, so I want to make sure we're on the same page. It's just going to be pre-recorded, so there won't be in no chats or anything like that. Oh, where's my cursor? All right. So special populations, we know that uh, delivering children and all that is not what everybody wants to do in the world. It is in the basic scope of practice for a basis to deliver. Um, so don't be eh, too worried when they tell you, hey, look, it's time to suit up, it's time to deliver that baby. Um, we're going to go over uh, normal deliveries. We're going to go over some vaginal bleeding and uh, pregnant patients. Um, anatomy and physio, you know, of normal pregnancies and the path of complications of pregnancy. We all can face this. We don't ever know which one we're going to get to see. Um, but at some point, we are going to have to deal with one of them. Uh, we'll talk about some more about some obstetrics, obstetrics, sorry, I, that word gets me every time. So we're going to go over the normal delivery, uh, how to deal with abnormals, nuclear cord, prolapse cord, and a breech delivery. Uh, kind of go over some details on those, on how to handle it, what to do. Yeah, you're going to freak out and be like, oh, I don't know what to do. But if you just stop, slow down, breathe, take a deep breath, you'll be able to handle things. So we'll go more into the third tri trimester bleeding. Uh, you'll have placenta previa, some mm -hmm. abrupto placenta. Mm -hmm. Those are all possible. Y'all going to hear a lot of noise in the background. It is daytime out here, and there's a lot of work going on, so I apologize for the noise. Um, you may have run across some spontaneous abortions and or miscarriages, and you're not only having to treat the mental part of the, of the mother, and mm -hmm. you may also have to be physically having to treat them. Um, we're going to go over ectopic pregnancies, prelamps, and eclampsia, uh, pre-eclampsia and eclampsia. Then we're going to talk about how to take care of these new babies. What are we going to do? How are we going to treat them? Some anatomy of the babies, just so we're like, oh my God, it's a new one. What do I do? Well, we want you to know. Go over trauma. Trauma plans is the fundamental knowledge of the basic uh, emergency care, transport, and based on assessment findings and acute injury. But just so you know, when you are transporting, and then and the mother goes, hey, I f I'm pushing. I have a baby. I feel some pressure between my legs. You have to stop the ambulance. You cannot deliver a baby going down the roads against the law. So just keep that in the back of your mind when it is time to deliver that you physically have to stop the ambulance. And welcome to this new child into the world. We want to talk about some special considerations in trauma. You may have... Uh, Multi-system trauma of the pregnant patient, then you got a pediatric patient potentially, and then you know talk about ger geriatric patients, and they're all that special, uh, the special parts that they're all in their own ways they're dangerous. It's scary to think about what potentially can happen. Go over the patho of the pregnant. Uh, we're going to do some pediatric, geriatric, and a conjunctively impaired patient. So we'll dabble in a lot of things tonight, today afternoon, lunch, brunch, whatever you want to call it. So most deliveries occur in a hospital with some doctors and nurses ready to go. But occasionally the birth process is, moves a little bit faster than anyone's expecting, and it may not make it to the hospital. Uh, you must decide then, like it says, you're going to assist the delivery on scene, or you're going to transport them to the hospital. How far is this place? Where am I going? How fast can I get there? How, how often are there con, or the contractions? So those are things that we need to know and want to know before we try to make this decision. We're going to the hospital. All right, so the female reproduct, reproductive system includes, we've gone over all this. I hope everybody knows this. If not, maybe we can talk on the sub, but you should know this. So you have your ovaries, your fallopian tubes, your uterus, your cervix, your vagina, and the breast. So the ovaries. Ovaries are two glands. Uh, we, we showed this in some of the pictures in the past. Uh, we went over different chapters uh, where the exact where the ovaries are located. So each ovary contains thousands of follicles. So the follicles contains the eggs, or a egg, sorry. During each menstrual cycle, there will only be one follicle that is successfully maturing and ready to become an egg. So ovulation occurs approximately two weeks prior to menstruation. Um, my wife says that it's hell on wheels, but you know what? Hey, I, I bless them, bless them, bless them, because I don't know if I can handle that. Just saying. So if the fertile egg gets implants into the, uh, if the egg implants in the intermediotrum, 
I don't think I said that right. The line inside of the uterus, if the egg is not fertilized within 36 to 48 hours of it being there, it is released and then dies, and the lining is shed as the menstrual flow. Um, this occurs about the 28th day of a woman's cycle. That's that's what they're saying is average. Uh, you can don't quote me to that, but that's mostly average. So the fallopian tube distends out laterally from the uterus with one tube associated with each ovary. We've seen the picture. We know what it looks like. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> y'all know the location of them too. So fertilization occurs when a sperm meets the egg, usually when the egg is inside the fallopian tube. So the fertilized egg then continues to the uterus and imp of implantation occurs and it develops into a embryo and then the fetus and then a fetus and grows until the time of delivery. It's a little crumb muncher then. So the uterus is a muscular organ that encloses and protects the developing fetus approximately nine months or 40 weeks. That's the goal. That's our ultimate goal. So the uterus process produces contractions during labor and which is ultimately what helps push down the fetus through the birth canal but sometimes it needs to be removed by manually and they cut you open so the birth canal is made up the of the vagina and the lower third of the uterus and that's called the cervix got a picture coming up so maybe you can understand that during pregnancy in the cervix uh during pregnancy the cervix contains a mucus plug that seals the uterine open preventing contamination. So when the cervix begins to dilate, the plug is discharged into the vagina as a pink tinted mucus or a bloody show. And sometimes a lot of people do get scared about that and I completely get it. So I understand when we're all like, I don't know what that is, but I'm nervous now. But it's a small amount of bloody discharge and that is what's telling you that it's time for delivery. That's your like, it's time for delivery here comes the baby so here we go we talked about this already here's our cervix it sits right here you have your sacrum which is your butt your booty right here's your rectum the vagina the opening with the child's coming out the amniotic fluid is wrapped around here on our little yellow sack we have our placenta that comes out that provides all the nutrients and all that your fundus which encloses the baby so we have all these things that we should know about we just need to see the pictures to help us with the placement cool so the vagina is the outermost cavity of the female reproductive system, and it does make the lower birth canal. Well, got that. And it begins at the cervix and ends as the external opening of the body. The vagina completes the passageway from the uterus to the outside world for the newborn. So, poop, there we go. Now they are. They're coming from the mom. Now they're out and into the world. The perineum is the area between the va vagina... I guess they need him louder than we need him. That was loud. All right, so the breast produce milk and the memory gland, the glands, uh, is carried through the small duct to the nipple to provide nourishment to the newborn. Ah, we know. Uh, that is, some people produce more than others, but, you know, sometimes you can't produce at all. And that's why we, thank goodness, we have other ways to feed them. So the placenta is the darkest shape uh, right in here. That's this color, that's the dark one. Um, it's connected to the fetus by the umbilical cord. Right here, done. There's all the nutrients come from right here. The placenta berries can, the barrier consists of two layers of cells. Uh, let's see here. Um, I don't know if it's showing it, but you know, anyway. So what that does is it helps, pass, it's separated, but allows substances. So, sorry, let me back that up. The two layers of skin is keeping circulation going between the mom and the child, but it is it's thick enough, but it allows fluid to come back and forth between them. So we are able that's how the nutrients come in forth and and pass along each other. Anything ingested by a pregnant female uh, was has the potential to affect the, the fetus. Um, all of those. Nutrients, oxygen, waste, carbon dioxide, many toxins, and most medications. That's why they're very careful on what you take. We want to limit that. All right, so after the delivery, the placenta separates from the uterus and is delivered also. That's why you never want to let go of the cord. 
The umbilical cord is the lifeline of the fetus, connecting it to the woman and the fetus through the placenta. Uh, the umbilical vein carries oxygenated blood from the placenta to the heart of the fetus. The umbilical arteries carry deoxygenated blood from the heart to the fetus of the placenta. Pretty freaking cool. All right. The fetus develops inside a fluid sac, bag-like membrane called the amniotic sac. That holds roughly 500 to 1,000 milliliters of amniotic fluid, and that helps. Basically, it's like an insulation to the child. It provides the cushioning. Uh, it's like living in a like in a water bed. You're protected by the fluid on the inside. So the amniotic fluid is released and is in a gush when the sac ruptures. Sometimes they have to open the sac. They'll go in there and poke it. Sometimes it is opened prior. It's no big deal. Um, that's also the beginning sign of labor. Normal changes in pregnancies. We know these are going to change. The female is going to start breathing a little bit heavier. Sometimes it's going to be more uh, harder for them to breathe. Okay. Cardiovascular. Their cardiac rate is going to increase. Their musculoskeleton. They, they're gonna, they, things are going to start hurting. They're going to carry things different. Uh, when the baby starts dropping, getting ready to come to the birth canal, all those things are going to affect the mother because of what's going on. They're going to, the center of gravity is rotating and changing. Who oh, do we know this one? So the reproductive system hormone levels increase to support fetal development and prepare the body for birth. This puts pregnant women at an increased risk for complications for trauma, bleeding, and some medical conditions. As the fetus develops and grows, the uterus also grows, stretching and accommodate for a full-term labor. I'm sorry, full-term fetus. I'm thinking something else. As the side of the uterus, as the size of the uterus increases, so does the amount of fluid. So when you start, you're not automatically at 500 liters, milliliters, and you don't finish at 1,000. You could have more. If you're having twins, you could have more than 1,000 liters in there. So the uterus is displaced out of the normal, well-protected position within the pelvic area, and the increased chance of a direct fetal injury can occur. So rapid urine, uterine growth occurs during the second trimester. As the uterus grows, it pushes up on the diaphragm, displacing it from a normal position. That's where you have your ladies be like, oh, they'll lean back and try to breathe because they can't take deep breaths because, they're, I mean, their diaphragm's not able to contract. So we would expect that. Oh, look, there she goes. Y'all didn't miss that. So that being the case, there's automatically going to have um, respiratory distress there. Uh, respiratory uh, capacity uh, changes with increased respiratory rate and decreased minute volume because they're not obtaining as much in, uh, oxygen when they do this. All right, so overall, overall blood volume for the mother is going to increase also. You, are, you need to prepare for blood loss that will occur during childbirth. Uh, the blood volume may eventually increase up to 50%. By the end of the pregnancy. Just think about that. That's a lot of freaking blood that this mama's toting around. Anne's got to clean it. Anne's got to circulate it. So think about the heart, you know, the heart load that you're also producing also. The number of red blood cells also increase. The speed of clotting increases to protect excessive bleeding during pregnancy. And then by the end of pregnancy, the pregnant patient's heart rate goes up 20% to accommodate all that blood loss, blood volume. Bruh, you think y'all had trouble? Come on, bruh. That's the reason why I think pregnant women are so awesome. Man, they got this. I'm glad it's, the, it's not the other way around. So now think about their cardiac output. If it's going up 20%, imagine what their cardiac output is like. Oh, they got to be tired. So in the third trisemester, trisemester ha, in the third trimester, there is an increased risk of vomiting and potential aspiration following trauma because of changes that occur in the gastro tract. Changes that in the gastrointestinal tract mobility. Shoot, let me start over. Changes in the gastrointestinal mobility and the displacement of the stomach upward significantly increases the chance that a pregnant trauma patient 
will vomit and aspirate if you're unable to clear the airway. Think about that. Keep that in your mind. Changes in the cardiovascular system and the increased demand of supporting the fetus significantly increases the work of the heart. Well, we know that for sure. The blood gone up 50%. Whew. Remember, not all women are healthy when they try to begin pregnancy. Then you have your cardiac compromise. That's where you'll find out if they have a cardiac overload. Sometimes pregnant women going into pregnancy will be bedridden because of the stress of the heart. Weight gain. I'm not going there. Just going to read what the PowerPoint says and no comments. <laughs> the increase of the body weight will eventually change. We know that's going to happen. The heart and the impact of the musculoskeletal system is going to be stressed. Uh, increased hormones. Uh, they affect making the joints a little bit looser. They're not as stable. A little bit more uh, like what a, uh, I don't know. A, and the third trimester tri changes in the body center of gravity changes, and that's going to increase our slip, trips, and falls. Most pregnant women are healthy, but some will be ill when they conceive or become ill during pregnancy. You can always use oxygen to do there. Give them oxygen all the time because we automatically know that they're having trouble breathing because of that big old baby. Uh, we are going to come across diabetes, uh, that developing in many women who have not had diabetes previously. Uh, this condition is called gest gestational diabetes that resolves in most women after delivery. Okay, okay, we can, we can kind of work that. Uh, you're going to treat it the same way for other diabetic patients. Uh, a pregnant woman may control her own blood glucose level with a diet. Uh, that them and the doctor may have worked out something for them to take. How are they going to function? A pregnant woman may control. Uh, I already read that one. In some cases, the woman will have to manage her condition with insulin. That is very, very closely regulated. A pregnant woman exercise uh, experiencing hyperglycemia or hypo, hyper or hypoglycemia should be cured by, by the same manner any patient has with diabetes. So, hypertensive disorders. So, we know their blood pressure is going to go up. You can expect it. One complication that occurs occasionally does happen is typically in patients who are pregnant for the first time, you're going to see preeclampsia or pregnancy induced hypertensive. This condition can develop in the 20th week characterized by the following signs. You're going to have severe hypertension, severe or persistent headaches. You're going to have visual abnormalities such as you'll see spots. Some may be blurred vision and there may be sight, uh, light sensitive. So don't forget about that. Obviously, we're going to have swelling to the hands and the feet. So that's going to increase the edema because of the fluid and their anxiety is going to increase. Uh, a relative, a related condition, eclampsia, is characterized by seizures that occur as a result of hypertension. Uh, to treat patients who have in seizures caused by eclampsia, we're going to lay the patient on the on her left side. We're going to make sure her airway stays open. Give them supplemental oxygen. If they do vomit, okay, just suck them out. Make sure you just clear it out really well. Provide rapid transport and call for an AL, uh, advanced life support if available. It's easy. I say it, but it's not. I promise you when you're sitting here learning it, I promise you it's scary. Transporting the patient on their left side can prevent supine hypotensive syndrome. So it's very important when they're pregnant that they stay on their left side because it's it helps with the body and there's not as much stress put on the body with them being on the left side versus the right side. So here's our fertilized eggs. It's got to go through the fallopian tube. We know the embryo that's going to turn into a baby. Uh, internal bleeding may be a sign of an ectopic pregnancy. That's when the em embryo develops outside of the uterus, most often in the fallopian tubes. Okay, we got that. And this occurs about once every 300 pregnancies, not by an individual, but in total. All right, some of the leading causes of maternal death in the first trimester is internal hemorrhaging. And uh, when they do hemorrhage, they're going to hemorrhage into the abdomen. 
considering the possibility of an ectopic pregnancy in a woman who has missed a menstrual cycle and complains of seven, sudden severe usually unilateral pain in the lower abdomen you can tell if they're having a bleed or not all right so we're going to talk a little bit more into hemorrhaging hemorrhaging from the vagina that occurs before labor begins may be serious you may need some ALS back up on this uh, in early pregnancies, it may be a sign of a spontaneous abortion. Unfortunately, it could be a miscarriage, too. In the later stages of pregnancy, vaginal hemorrhaging may indicate a serious condition, and that may be where the placenta is tearing from the walls of the, of the mother. In an abrupt placenta, the placenta is separates prematurely from the wall of the uterus and that's most commonly caused by some hypertension or a massive trauma to the, to the stomach. A patient often reports pain, but the vaginal bleeding may not be heavy. It may be spotty. Uh, it may not worry about it for the first day and then call for about the second or third day. Remember, in the placenta previa, the placenta develops over the and covers the cervix. It's very, very serious. They may also have some uh, heavy vaginal bleeding and a lot of pain. I mean, a lot. And you, the best thing you can do is decrease their anxiety Then during those times. Um, it does help how it reacts to the, the, the fetus. So if you can decrease it, the better off you are on the fetus change. You'll notice the heart rate change. As you can see here, oh, right here, this is a normal birth. The baby comes out head first, placenta comes out later. This one right here in the abrupto placentia, it has completely changed the courses, and the baby's putting pressure on the placenta, and that's where the blood's coming from. Uh, you can see right here around the bottom, that's where the blood is. Up here, there's a hemorrhage, so it's starting to tear, and you can see it in these pictures. All right, passage of the fetus in the placenta before 20 weeks is an abortion, unfortunately. Abortions may be spontaneous. They may be a miscarriage. They ha may have to be induced. Uh, they plan those, unfortunately. Deliberate abortions uh, may be self-induced or planned or performed in the hospital or clinic. Most serious complications are bleeding and severe infections. Bleeding can result from a portions of the fetus or placenta being left in the uterus or being an incomplete abortion. Infection can cause such, oof, oh man, infection can result from serious preparation from the use of a non-sterile instrument. The woman is in shock, treat for transport, get them to the most appropriate facility, never pull any tissues or anything from the vagina. You want to place a sterile pad on top of the vagina and tell the patient, Try to use calming measures, if possible. Pregnant women have an increased chance of being victims of domestic violence and abuse. It's a little bit harder for them to get up and run or fight because of everything's going on. They could they could suffer a spontaneous abortion, go into premature delivery, and then the baby may be super low in weight. Uh, the women is at risk from bleeding infection and a urine rupture. Uh, use calm. Be cool with them, bro. They just been through a traumatic event. Just take some time. Uh, pregnant patients who are abused often are scared and may not be honest as how their injuries may have occurred because they don't want to report that or they don't want to look like it's their fault. Just talk to the patient. Uh, maybe pull them off to the side. Uh, separate them from anybody. See what's going on. Uh, the best way for you to care for them uh, for the for the fetus is to treat the mom. If you think that they need to get out of there, maybe best you can treat them. And that's where you can say, hey, it's only our service only allows one person in the back. We can't allow you to ride in there. If it gets serious, call for police. You know, hopefully there are fires there with you to help and they can help. So some pregnant women, we know that they have some addictions. Um, during addictions that it could reduce to prematurity, uh, low birth weight, 
severe respiratory distress, and the fetus could possibly die. Fetal alcohol syndrome is very serious. Uh, some conditions of the infants are born that are, are already alcoholics. If you're called to handle the delivery of an, an addicted, uh, a woman that is addicted to something, pay special close attention to your safety. Uh, obviously wear your PPE. Uh, some clues that you may be dealing with in an addicted patient, the presence of drug paraphernalia, empty wine or liquor bottles, statements made by the family or bystanders, that's, or maybe the patient even says that something that you're like, wait, what, what'd she just say to me? The newborn, once they're born, will probably automatically need some assistance done for them. And it'd be a rapid deal. Like you need to hurry up and take care of them. And, you know, your partner has, may have to just take care of the, the mother. I'm um, assist with the delivery. Be, be prepared to provide oxygen for the newborn. Super important. Uh, special considerations for trauma and pregnancies. A trauma call will involve a pregnant woman. You have two patients con to consider, the woman and the unborn fetus. Uh, Pregnant women may be uh, victims of many types. We talked about that, assaults, motor vehicle crashes, shootings. Um, pregnant women also have an increased risk of falling compared to non-pregnant ones. Um, hormonal changes uh, loosens the joints in the musculoskeletal system. And this is an increased weight of the uterus and displacement of abdominal organs can affect their balance. Because now their center of gravity is off. It's changing. They're in different places. They are... Uh, not balanced as well if they if they do this rapid change of weight they got to get used to that all right pregnant women have an increased amount of overall total blood volume we talked about that can go up to 20 percent higher can be more um, a pregnant trauma patient may experience a significant amount of blood loss before you detect any sign because now they're having to compensate for that loss so the fetus may also be in trouble as well we don't have a way to check fetal heart uh, pulse pressures in the field. Uh, the best we can do is treat the mother, stop the bleeding, and ask a lot of questions. You need to be alert for additional concerns and ready to assess and manage different types of injuries when you respond to a pregnant trauma. The uterus is big, Tom, vulnerable for penetrating traumas. Um, a trauma injury to the pre pregnant uterus can be severely life-threatening to the fetus and to the mother. And in a lot of cases, the only chance to save the fetus is to adequately resuscitate the woman. It's kind of a touchy topic. Oof, man. Why is it not clicking? All right. So when they're involved in a motor vehicle crash, you want to know the mechanism of injury. Uh, I always suggest that pregnant females go to the f medical facility to be checked about when they're pregnant. I always do it. Trauma is one of those leading causes of abrupto placentas. You should suspect abrupto placenta when there is blunt trauma to the abdomen, period. No questions asked. Common symptoms include vaginal bleeding and a lot of abdominal pain. Plain. Abdominal pain. Do a quick, thorough assessment of the patient. Obviously, support the airway. Provide high-flow O2. Place sanitary pads in the vagina if needed. Position the patient on their left side and ready them for transport. Um, carefully assess a pregnant woman's abdomen and chest for seatbelt marks. Be cautious during that. You may cause more damage trying to assess that, but just use, you know, a good one. Uh, cardiac arrest. <laughs> oh, God. This is so, it's it's sad. It sucks. Uh, I've done it twice. It was not good. Remember, the only chance you have to save the fetus is to do all you can do for that mother. Performing CPR and providing transport to a hospital according to what your local protocols say. If, and I say if, the woman's in the last month or two of the pregnancy, Compressions may need to be applied a little bit higher 
on the sternum than what we're used to doing? If, if it is possible, one provider should be assigned to manually displace the uterus towards the patient's left side to facilitate blood return to the right side of the heart. So what that means is you may have to push and pull the heart to one, I mean the fetus to the left side. It's, it's something that you may need to do for the betterment of this mother. You should notify the re receiving response. Let the hospital know as soon as possible that you are en route with a pregnant cardiac arrest. They need to have not only people to take care of the mother, but they may end up having to bring a surgeon in to do surgery, uh, do a rapid delivery right there in the ER, and then they need some people to take care of the baby. That is not something that they can just snap their fingers and get there. That is a that is something that has to be prepared and rapidly brought, but it's not a fast process. So they need to know as fast as they can. All right. I'm trying to clean my glasses so I can see the screen. I'm sorry. It's taking me a minute. All right. When you do your assessment, focus the assessment on the management of the patient. Um, you should suspect shock based upon the MOI. Eh, just got to be prepared. If they start vomiting, automatically assume that there's going to be potential for aspiration. Uh, if you're able to figure out how far along they are, that's great. If not, you just go with what you can imagine and about guess it's good as good as guess as you can it's the best i can tell you all right so following guides when treating pregnant patients maintain an open airway you got to be able to get air in uh keep their suction unit very close <laughs> obviously apply high flow o2 100 oxygen by non-rebreather mask is recommended you need to make sure that you have proper and adequate ventilations this is the time you need to assess breath sounds. Listen to them bilaterally. Make sure bilateral that you hear bilateral breath sounds. If the patient's ventilations are inadequate, you need to start bag bow mask at 100% O2 also. We're going to control the bleeding. We're going to assess the circulation at this time. Always in the back of your mind, keep a high index of uh, suspicion for internal bleeding. Depending upon their MOI, if it's high enough, you're pretty sure you're going to have some shock uh, that's going on. Always, always, always keep the mother warm. Don't let them get cold. Transport the patient on her left side. If you suspect spinal injury, tilt the backboard to the left by 30 degrees. Now, I expect you to get your degree measurer out and put it at 30 degrees. Now, man, I'm just make it. Come on. Make it right. Do the best you can. Put it, you know, a bag back there or something that's, you know, you're like, ah, that's close enough. The majority of it's on the left side. Transport the patient to the trauma center if available. So some culture sensitive, uh, culture values considerations. Uh, culture sensitivity is important when you're assessing and treating a pregnant patient. Women of some cultures may have values and systems that are going to affect you. The choice of how they care for themselves during pregnancy, either prenatal or not, or no whatsoever. Did they plan for this baby to come? Some religions won't allow other men to help deliver them, and they may just say, no, you can go. You may have to do some whining and dining and stealing to find you a female to show up to take care of these, help you out with this pregnancy. Um, some cultures may not, uh, it's like I said right there. You should respect all differences and honor the request of the patients. Your responsibility is to the patient and is limited to providing care and transportation based upon the religion. Always respect that. Uh, rational adults has the high right, the right to refuse or any part of your assessment. And tell them what you need to do. Say, this is what I need to do. Is there somebody here that can do this for me? And tell me what they see, find, or whatever else. Teenage pregnancies is very, it's, oh, that's a hard topic. God, I'm naughty. That's rough. 
But in the United States, it has one of the highest teenage pregnancies through anywhere throughout the world. It is likely that during your career, you are going to respond to a pregnant teenager who may not may or may not be in delivery, but they close. Pregnant teenagers may not know that they are pregnant at all, or they may be in just plain denial about it. You, As you begin assessment of a female teenager, remember that the pregnancy is possible, like I've told you before. If they have their reproductive system, they are a potential for being pregnant. Uh, respect the teenager's privacy and their need for independence. If possible, perform your assessment of, let's say, in the history away from family members. Be very aware of the laws within your state so you can know what you can and can't do versus the teenager's rights. Um, and are they allowed to refuse, uh, give, refuse? for themselves and you don't have to get a, a parent signature. Childbirth is seldomly unexpected event. You have these rare ass cases out there that are like, oh, I didn't know I was pregnant and I started cramping like I was having a period and boom. I just don't know how you didn't know you were pregnant. Poof. Uh, dispatch protocols usually include the dispatcher asking some simple questions. Uh, most time they're not going to tell you because they don't want to talk that long. Uh, contractions are very important. Uh, we need to know how long they are, how far they are apart, and that will help our overall thought process. I'm going to tell y'all, y'all going to want all gowns, goggles, gear, rain suits, knee-high boots. It's just, it's not like it's that bad, but you want to protect those bodily fluids that are fist enough to be produced, and you need to make sure those bodily fluids are not on you. Um, make it as an injury. If you can, figure it out, figure it out. Don't develop tunnel vision just because this person is pregnant, and you're like, oh, my God, I got, a, I got two patients now. I'm just, you know, this one's worse. I got to figure out how to take care of one, and now they want me to do both of them. Well, yeah, it's ultimately your job to treat the patient because now you got a two-for-one ride that you have to treat it's you need to make sure you take care of mama before you can take care of the baby and hopefully the baby can come out and you can get your field delivery and you can move on um, and then that time hopefully mama doesn't need your help anymore and you can focus on the baby and uh you by the whole time you're screaming at your partner to go faster to get there and i get it been there deliver 22 in the field so i know i know exactly what you're thinking so the primary assessment, obviously, I know we talked about this. Get your primary assessment. What is my general impression of this? Can they make it? Can they just hold it and not have to let me mess with it? Can they squeeze a little bit tighter so I don't have to do this? Make it fast in examination. Oh, I'm having contractions. All right, let's go. What the hell are you waiting on? Put them on a stretcher. Get them comfortable. Get them on the left side and go. The faster you can get to the hospital, the faster that baby's not coming on your watch, folks. Mama, ABCs. Anytime there's a trauma, make sure your ABCs or life-threatening issues are considered and handled first. Stop the bleeding. Make sure their blood stays in. If they're bleeding a lot, it's suspect shock. Um, blood loss after delivery is expected, but it should not be copious amounts of blood. You always want to know what their skin color temperature and moisture is because you don't want them to get sick. You you don't. You want them to you don't want them to, you know, to get cold because then their body's gonna start compensating differently. Um if you think you start to have signs of shock, we're gonna give them a little oxygen because it's cheap and free. Not really. We know everything on the ambulance costs money. All right. If the delivery is imminent, prepare the delivery at, at the house. We first have a home delivery. If the place to deliver is in the back of the ambulance or the home, which one do you want? Well, I would rather have a lot of room so I didn't have to clean it up. So I'm going to do it right there. If it's not happening right now, make sure you get ready for transport. But if you know it's going to be with the next five minutes, 
and the hospital's 15 minutes away. So it's like, we finna have a baby. I'm gonna call for another unit. Provide rapid transport if they have significant bleeding, hypertension. The mother starts having a seizure, or all of a sudden you'll notice that their mental status has changed. You, I, I honestly, if you're running a basic truck and you know that you're having a pregnancy, I'd call for another truck anyway, and because uh, you're going to need extra support. Uh, they could send you an ALS unit at that time. Um, they may send you another BLS unit, depending on your area, and that's okay too, because two eyes are better than one. Two sets of eyes are better than one. So I'm okay with having another unit there. Because they can help me. Maybe they can just say something that can, you know, pro provoke my brain. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. If we can do the history, get a good history. Sample, we know that. Secondary assessment, we should know that. Vital signs. I'm just going to say most time in the vital signs, uh, set it to five minutes and just go with it. If you've got a monitor that can work, that's let your monitor go every five minutes. That way that no matter what happens, you have a crap load recordings of blood pressures, and then you can pick and choose which ones you need or you want to help you write your report. Reassessment. We know um, if you have to check them to see if they're bleeding, I mean, uh, getting ready to deliver, explain to them. Be like, ma'am, listen, I need to take a quick look. I need to see if you're crowning or if you have any pressure. I need to take a quick look. Don't reach down there and try to feel it because you don't know what you're feeling for because we're not OBGYNs. But if you start to see crowning, guess what, boys and girls? Suit up. It's time to go. Communication documentation. Let the hospital know as fast as you can that you're not just dicking around and you're bringing in two patients instead of one because you just delivered the baby. If you're on scene and you're stuck for a while and delivery takes up to 30 minutes, you need to prepare for a rapid transport because there's something going on that you can't handle and that you're going to need assistance and the hospital is going to have to worry about that. Give me a second. Let me step away and get a drink. Because if it's taken up to 30 minutes to deliver that baby, you gonna need some uh, procedures done, and we can't do those in the field. Ooh, that water's cold. Uh, so this goes into your gravida para. You need to know how many weeks of gestation. Gravida means how many times have they been pregnant, and para means how many living births did they have. So you need to know your GP, not general practitioner. It's GP. All right, so here comes the status, stages of labor. This is like imminent labor that's coming. This is in the last couple of weeks. You'll be able to notice this. Um, so you will have dilation of the cervix. You will have delivery of the fetus and then delivery of the placenta. And that is it, boys and girls. You will have everything that you need to do at that point, And then it's time to go. Hopefully, I've never been able to deliver a fetus because... I mean, fetus, a placenta, because I've always delivered the baby and then en route to transport to the hospital. The placenta has never delivered for me. So I'm cool with that because uh, then that's the bad part, in my opinion, is delivering that big old thing and blood everywhere. So they can keep that. So your first stages begins with an onset of contractions and ends when the cervix is fully dilated. So the first stages usually is the longest. It's up to about 16 hours. I've seen people go hours on for that. Uh, the onset of labor starts with contractions of the uterus. Um, some other signs of the beginning of labor are that little bloody spot or the rupture of the amniotic sac. Remember that is called the plug. If the plug is delivered, you should have a little bit of a uh, little bit of blood. Or if their water breaks. And they just gush water. That's not like five gallons of water. But ladies will know. Oh, my God. I think I just wet myself. Well, it's, it could be the start of delay, the start of labor. Um, the intensity of contractions. Some are worse. Some are a lot. Some are not. I don't know. Um, it says the uterine contractions become more regular and last about 30 to 60 seconds. Y'all can have that. I don't want that. It's all on y'all. 
some labor is generally longer in a prima gravida, a woman experiencing her first pregnancy, than in a multi gravida, a woman who has had multi pregnancies. A woman is, may experience preterm or false labor, as known as Braxton Hicks. You should provide transport for the patient even if they are having Braxton Hicks, because we don't know. And if true labor is coming, prepare for that baby, because here it comes. All right, so in your book, you will check, take a glance at 33-1. It, it tells you some signs and symptoms of Braxton Hicks versus labor. Gives you an idea of the difference. Um, you may have some of these. They may be intermitting. Well, we don't really know, so what we need to do is just treat them both as it is very serious. Let, let's get that taken care of. Some women experiencing a premature rupture of the membrane in which the amniotic sac ruptures too early um, and the fetus is not delivered. The patient may or may not go into labor. It just depends. Uh, you will need to provide a lot of supportive care during this transport. Uh, towards the end of the third semester, the head starts to rotate, the body gets situated, the pelvis, uh, the, the head may get down into the pelvis, uh, the woman starts having a lot more discomfort, feel like the hips done got bigger and wider overnight. Um, the movement down into the pelvis basically is, is getting ready for dirt, is, uh, is birth, and that is also called lightning. I've never heard that but that's what they say. So the second stage, so now we're getting a lot closer. Second stage is beginning with the fetus to encounter, enter the birth canal. Uh, and this is gonna be a spontaneous birth. During this stage, you will have to make a decision. Are we gonna help and deliver here? Or are we going to transport? That's where now you make the best the best part of your money is made right there. Like, oh, God, do I got to do this? Do I got to do this? Or we're going to go to the hospital. Urine contract uh, contractions are usually closer together, and they do last longer. Under no circumstance, don't let the woman go to the bathroom. Don't do it. Mm -mm. Uh, what's to say? The premium will begin to bulge significantly, and the top of the fetus head should begin to appear in the vaginal opening. That sometimes you may have to look, and that is also called crowning. If they are crowning, suit up, get ready to snap. I mean, hike. I mean, no, I'm just kidding. It's time to deliver, baby. The third stage of the labor begins with the birth of the newborn child. During this stage, the placenta must pull away, separate. Uh, it needs to deliver also. Um, this can also take 30 minutes or longer. Um, it does, they have deep massaging when this doesn't take place. They will, you will think the nurse is trying to push her arm, hers or his or her arm, through the female stomach. Oh, come on, I've seen it done, and it's like, oh my god. I think maybe delivering the baby was not as bad as what they're doing, but it's it gets pretty serious. All right, so consider delivery at the scene when you see some of these things. If you know that it's going to happen right then gonna deliver right now if it's inclement weather because it's gonna delay you you get called there during a natural disaster because hurricane Mike is pounding and they didn't decide to leave and now it's your turn to go get them you may have to stay and deliver right there uh, we all live in some areas where tornadoes and hurricanes and all these storms happen buckle up girls and boys it's what we all signed up for a lot of things you need to ask how long have you been pregnant how many babies you got? Then, unfortunately, you have to say, how many living babies do you have? And how long have you been having contractions? How far apart are they? Okay, well, then tell me how long they last. And then the, the faster they get back to back to back, guess what, boys and girls? I think you already know. So have you ever had any bleeding or have you has your water broken? If you start getting checks to all these, guess what? It's gonna be an on scene delivery. 
Do you feel like you have to take a poo? Do you feel the need to push this this demon out of you because they done they done made their way to come out? Where was any of your previous deliveries by a C section? That's very important. Have you had any problems or any previous pregnancies? Do you use drugs, drink alcohol, or take any medications? I, I like this one. Is there any chance you may be having multiple kids? Because I need to know this. And does did your physician tell you that you were a high risk? Sometimes they might not tell them to expect complications because at this point they're probably going to be inside the facility uh, if they even suspect them getting close to being delivered. So just say, hey, or, were you expecting any complications or have you had complications during your pregnancy? And that'll start to give you some ideas. If the patient says that she is about to deliver, trust me when I say then listen to them, and she has a bowel movement or feels the need to push, get ready. Get that gown out. It's time to catch. Um, what's that say? Does she have an extremely firm abdomen? Usually inspect the vagina to check for crowning. That gives you your, it's it's game on. All right. Once the deliver has begun, you cannot stop it. It's not, you can't say squeeze that thing. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh We're not there yet. Don't attempt to patients to hold the patient's leg together. It's not going to work. Don't let her go to the bathroom because you don't want to be fishing this baby out the, bed, out, the t out the toilet. Just tell them, make sure that they're comfortable and understanding that, the need to move her bowels is normal, and that means that she's about to deliver. If your decision is to deliver on scene, remember that you're only assisting the woman with the delivery, and you're not trying to make them deliver. Your part is only there to help guide and support the baby. That's it. It's like to get the baby out. You want to appear as calm and reassuring and protect their modesty as much as you can. Now, if they all blaze in glory when you get there, families, they, they, that's, it's over. They done. So just recognize, recognizing when the situation is beyond your level of training and you're like, oh, shit, I really need some help. It's okay to walk in the door and be like, oh, I need some help right now. Call for it. Call for it early. If you have any questions, concerns, or problems, reach out to Med Control. Let them know what's going on. Let them know that you have a delivery and you need some assistance in delivering this baby. Here are some small things that should be like you should have a uh, delivery kit in your truck. You're gonna have the uh, these little the umbilical cut, the little clamps, and there's your knife to cut the cord. I said all of them. Um, maybe you have some a bulb syringe. That's the best booger sucker you've ever seen in your life. One you buy at the store sucks. It's just me. I'm saying. All right, now it's time to start preparing for delivery. The patient's clothing should be moved, like taken off, or pushed up past her waist, and just. And her pants and undergarments need need to go on. And you got them away. But remember, the most important thing is we preserve their privacy. Um, place the patient on a fir firm, I almost said firm, firm surface that's padded because it's got to be comfortable for them. And you want to have folded sheets and towels because it's just going to get wet. If you want to push... Push their buttocks, hips, sorry, hips. Eh, I don't know how you're going to judge two to four inches, but take you a, a pillow, put a pillow underneath them, maybe two pillows. Uh, get them to have somebody help hold the, the head and neck. That's their job, not yours. Uh, have her keep her legs and, a hips, and hips flexed with her feet flat on the surface beneath her and her knees spread apart. You know, I don't know how babies come out. Tell your people that you work with what the plan is, who's responsible for what, and then who's going to be responsible for the kid versus the mother. Okay, now if I'm going to do this, I need to deliver just the placenta. Y'all need to deliver this. I'm cutting the cord. Tell them the plan. 
make sure they know. If you happen to have an emergency delivery and it is going to happen at home, you need to move the patient to a sturdy, flat surface or maybe even on the floor. And then somebody needs to track this, this process and say what time we started versus what time we ended because it should it should not take 30 minutes to deliver a baby that's crowning now all right let's get prepared put on all your gear uh they say perfect per, what is this put on a protective face shield and gown i've always just worn gowns and glasses i'm not putting on keep your mouth shut that's the easiest way to do um if you can put towels and blankets down, it'll help uh, soak up some of the fluid that's coming out. You better have that OB kit like it is there, gas mask. You want that to put on you when you're getting ready. Game on, boys. I need to have this. Uh, place your drape uh, under the patient's buttocks and unfold it. Uh, what is that? Use the sterile sheets and drapes from the OB kit to make sure this, the delivery is sterile. Wrap another drape behind the patient's back and drape over each thigh. Drape another, man, you ain't got time for that. Here's your picture. That's what they want you to make it do. You ain't got time for all this. I'm going to tell you. These blue, that may be the best thing that you get right there. The best thing you can do also is may remind them to keep their feet on the ground. Because when they see how this one over here, their feet gets elevated. That's when you may end up catching a foot to the face. So... Be cautious about that. All right. Make sure you and your partner, uh, one's going to be at the head, one's going to be at the feet. If possible, you may have family. Help them breathe. Help them try to reassure them and calm down. Make sure that you don't run out of portable uh, oxygen on your portable tank. Don't do it. Just, just don't do it. If now that's only if they allow it. Uh, some parents, moms may say, "Get that off my face." It is common for the patient to become nauseated in, during delivery because you got to think they're doing a massive dump of uh, hormones when this is time happening. You want to always check on the patient if they're crowning, when they're crowning, and you need to keep an eye on that. Just checking some messages real quick. Um, some patients may experience uh, precipititis, labor, and birth. Mm -mm, don't know what that is. Can't tell you. Sorry. All right. Time the patient's contractions. You're going to have a list. Uh, it may get somebody with the family to do that for you. Um, that's very good for you to keep and have that for your documentations. All right. Now it's time to deliver head. Observe the head as it exits the vagina uh, so you can provide support as it emerges. Place your sterile gloved hand over the emerging bony part of the head and you want to control that delivery. You want to continue to support in the head as it rotates. The body should automatically rotate and do it. Basically, you're going to be there as a quarterback to catch things. You want to apply some general pressure to the perineum with the sterile glossed hand because you want to try to keep them from having any tearing. You can go from a zero to a three. Three is the worst tear that they can have just because it's a massive baby. And it could be a little, it could be a little bitty girl that's delivering this baby. Um, be prepared for possibility of the patient to poop on you. Um, most time they are going to poop versus peeing. Be prepared for that. Do not, do not poke your fingers in the newborn's eyes or fontanel. You don't want to mess with their head, eyes, just don't do it. Wrap that baby up and keep them warm. All right, so you have an unraptured amniotic sac. That's good. Usually it will rupture at the beginning of labor, sometimes during contractions. If it's not ruptured by the time the head of the fetus is crowning, it will appear kind of like a little bitty fluid, like a like a a, a watery uh, blister, basically is what it's going to look like. The sac will suffocate the fetus if you don't remove it, so you're going to have to butt, rupture it, get it out of the way. So you may puncture the sac with a clamp or tear it 
by twisting it like it's uh, like you're going to pinch it. Um, clear the newborn's mouth and nose using that bulb syringe, that old booger sucker. You want to do that immediately. Uh, it says, required by your protocols and wipe the mouth and nose with gauze. If the amniotic fluid is greenish, notify the receiving hospital because they have to do a, they have to clean the lungs of that poor baby. Uh, sorry. So the umbilical cord around the neck. As, as soon as you the head is delivered, use one finger to feel whether the umbilical cord is wrapped around the neck or not. You will know what this feels like. You're going to feel for the the uh, nuchal cord. Uh, the nuchal cord that is wound tightly around the neck could strangle the fetus. fetus. Usually, usually, and I say usually, you can slip the cord gently over the, over the delivered head. If not, you must cut it. Now, now, let's hang on until I get finished. Once the cord is cut, you must attempt to speed the delivery by encouraging the woman to push harder at, as push more and harder than before because the fetus will now have no oxygen to supply until it's delivered, uh, has spontaneous delivery. Now, if you cut it and clamp, you have to clamp it and cut it. This is where the key part is. If you have to do it, so the delivery of the body, once the, once the baby, the head is out, it's almost over. It does usually just sometimes rotate over. Sometimes you may have to just push down just a little bit. It's not hard at all. The, the rotation places the body into a better place for the fetus and it's less stressful. The head is the hardest part to get out because it's the biggest. All right. Remember that. Uh, support the head and the upper body as the shoulders are delivered. You want to just, it's, you're basically trying to do a um, spinal procedure. You just want us to hold on to it. Don't, do not, right here, look at this. Don't pull the baby from the birth canal. Is that good enough? All right. If the newborn will, the newborn is going to be slippery I highly, highly suggest that you be seated, have that baby delivered on something if it's your first time. It's going to be covered in that vernix cassiola, but it's a white cheesy substance. I'm just going to tell you, that's what it looks like. Mm. Mm. You think I'd be used to it if it made babies are delivered? Not happening. All right. If the mother is able and willing, hand the newborn and place it on her abdomen, skin to skin. A lot of mothers will want it on their chest. They need to have skin to skin contact immediately because that's going to help keep them warm. Dry that baby off. Dry it. Dry him or her. And put it in a blanket or a towel. Wrap that newborn uh, so only the face is exposed. You need to basically swaddle it the best that you can. Place that newborn on the side with the head slightly lower than the rest of the body. Cause it's got to get the blood situated. Got to get everything. Got to get everything flowing like it's supposed to. All right. You can pick up and cradle the newborn if you needed to. Uh, watch this say right there. If local protocol specific, keep newborn at the level of the woman's vagina until the umbilical cord is cut. Always keep the head slightly downward to help prevent aspiration. Wipe the mouth with a sterile gauze pad if needed. You want to move anything away from that mouth and nose as you can. Babies are mouth breathers anyway. They don't learn to be nose breathers until a little bit further in life. So you want that area to be as clean as possible. Stand by. I went too far. All right. Once you, all right. So post delivery care of the umbilical cord. Is super, super important because the infection can easily, easily be transmitted through the cord to that baby. All right. Once the cord has. I'm trying to figure out how to put this. So they say in here, once the cord has stopped pulsing, clamp and cut the cord. I have delivered some where the cord did not stop pulsating until. We, once the baby was delivered, I went on to the hospital. I have cut cords in the field. 
I have transported them with the cord still attached. You need to do some what your local protocols allow you to do. Um, once uh, evaluate the newborn for uh, term gestation, uh, you got to do the app. APGAR scale, if you know it, um, you got to do that within one minute of, of birth, and the hospital will question you about that. Uh, if you're not familiar in the APGAR scale, you need to learn it when you get into your field, get that going. So give, give the wrapped baby to your partner. Let them do something. It's time for them to do. You just deliver the baby. So if the mother is willing, give that baby to the mother and they're alert and they're able to hold that baby up. If you have time to deliver the placenta, that's cool. The placenta is attached to the umbilical cord and it, it will come out of the vagina. It's going to it's going to take its time. It's got to get released enough. Um, it's saying on here, never pull the end of the umbilical cord. But, you know, when you cut it, you're going to have to hold some tension on that cord otherwise it's automatically going to want to shrink up into the body okay so just keep that in the back of your mind do not delay transportation wait for the placenta no nah, bro keep going just it's time to go um the next slide is a little touchy um i'm just going to read it to you you can help slow some of the bleeding by gently massaging uh the female's abdomen uh, with a firm so circular motion. Um, you want to apply right on the abdomen. Basically what you're doing is you're trying to get it to start contracting and the bleeding to chill and work from there. Uh, we, uh, I'm just sorry, that next slide, I just, it's a little, I try to push on past that one. So you want to record the time of delivery. Make sure that that happens right there. Make sure 30 minutes elapse and the placenta if more than 30 minutes have gone by and the placenta is not there that's an emergency situation you need to go license sirens to the hospital if there's more than 500 milliliters of bleeding before the delivery of the placenta that's an emergency if significant bleeding after the delivery of the placenta that's an emergency you need to get gone with any of those three um they need to go promptly to the hospital and get some help. Um, so neonatal resuscitations. This is where it gets scary um, and gets a little scary on things and times and places because we all freaking out and we don't know what the hell's going on because now we just deliver this beautiful thing and it's not breathing. I got to do something now. All right. So the newborn usually begins spontaneously breathing about 15 to 30 seconds on their own with a heart rate of at least 120 you expect it to be a lot higher but at least it's there if you do not observe a response sometimes gently tapping on the feet or their soles or rubbing their back will spontaneously make them start breathing on their own sometimes they need that stimulation to provoke them to breathe a lot of newborns require some stimulation that will encourage them to breathe but sometimes most likely, most of the time, they'll start spontaneously doing it on their own. Um, if you position them in the uh, positioning of the airway, will get them to going. Uh, when you start drawing them, warming them, uh, that tactile stimulation of you touching them, rubbing them, um, just the general uh, feel of a person will help them do that on their own too. Oh, come on, bro! I'm doing the wrong thing. So in your book, you'll see 33-2. This is a uh, resuscitation for a newborn who is not breathing. It tells you what you need to do there. I'll let y'all read that for a second while I take me a drink of some cold beverage. Right on. All right, so to maximize the resuscitation measures, we want you to not freak the hell out. All right, deep breath, deep breath. Position the newborn on his or her back with the head down, just slightly extended. Place a towel or blanket under the shoulders because that's putting them in a sniffing position. Uh, and plus, you got to remember their head is a little bit bigger. 
than the rest of their body. If it is necessary, suction the mouth and nose with the bulb syringe out of your kit. Suction devices with an 8 or a 10 French catheter if you cannot get the bulb syringe to work. Suction both sides of the mouth. Uh, you want to do their cheeks, but avoid going deep into their throat. Just, just the best thing that you can do is to suck the, uh, the cheeks out. You want to try blow by oxygen. Uh, sometimes, uh, basically, you want to aim it at their mouth and nose during resuscitation. If they do get some spontaneously, they are potentially getting 100% O2. Um, drying, like we just read right there, that's, I'm not going to say don't flick or slap the soles of the feet. If I see you doing that to my baby, I'm probably going to flick or slap yo yourself. Just letting you know that. All right. Observe the newborn uh, for spontaneous. You want to check for their, dude, their skin color. It's going to change so fast. You'll notice it. Um, they'll go from that pale to that real pinkish color. Uh, you'll notice it on, uh, it, it'll change pretty quick. Uh, heart rate, super important. What What is their heart rate? And then you're going to have to listen to them. Put your stethoscope on. If you have a pediatric specific, Take that little bitty bell and listen to their heart rate. It's going to be hard to count, but you better get some count, bro. I need to know what that heart rate is at and how. Look at this chart right here. So if their beats more than a minute, you want to keep them warm and transport them. If it's beats less than 60 to 100, you need to start ventilating with the BVM. You want to recess every 90 seconds if the heart rate and respirations are not normal. You need to go with your uh, continue to reassess and call for ALS. Less than 60 beats a minute, you need to start CPR. If if they require chest compressions, use the one-handed. I pray to God y'all know CPR. Y'all have already had that, and I'm not gonna sit here and harp on y'all about CPR. Um, so let's go over the APGAR. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is better. Look at this one. All right, so the APGAR is, oh, wait, there you go. Now y'all can see what I'm looking at. So the APGAR is a scale of zero to three, and it has to, you have to get it in all these areas. So you, a perfect score is a 10, and you need to get it at one minute of birth and five minutes of birth, all right? Assessing the newborn, it gives you a uh, quick calculate the APGAR score to establish the baseline of this baby. Stimulation should result in an immediate increase in respirations rate. If not, you got to start with that BVM. If the newborn is okay and breathing well, you should next check the pulse rate by feeling the or listening to the chest by the stethoscope. At, at minimum, it should be 100 beats a minute. That's at minimum. If it is not, start giving ventilations with the BVM. You want to reassess that heart rate about every 30 seconds. Assess the newborn's oxygenation via a pulse ox if you have one that small. Um, if present, administer blow by oxygen, holding the oxygen tubing at a high flow close to the newborns. And you want to you want to set it about a five, four to five milliliters a minute on the oxygen. That's about as much as they need at one time. Uh, you are going to need a second unit here. The second unit can either take the mom and you take the child, or they will take the child and you'll take the mom. If you're starting to have, you can't have, you can't take care of two traumatic patients, and the delivery of a child is a traumatic. And now that the mother is needs to be separated from that baby because of complications, uh, some you want to use general general shoot gentle pressure when you're doing these ventilations. Remember, this is a just minute old newborn. CPR has been started. Do not stop it, or pronounce deceased by a physician. Nobody else.
Here's a picture of a breech baby. The feet are coming first. This is a traumatic. This is a emergency in the field. If you happen to, you can't get them to push, deliver, hope to God, you don't walk up and see a foot sticking out. But if you do, that is a rapid transport to the hospital. Oh, but if the buttocks have already passed through the vagina, the delivery has been gone. ALS has to be there. If the woman does not deliver the baby within 10 minutes, you, you need to go to the hospital fast. And the bottom line is very, very fast contact med control. All right. It's the same thing when you start delivery, except you're going to do it with the feet. Um, now, here's an important thing. If the head is almo almost always face down, oh, sorry, stand by. The head is almost always face down and should be allowed to deliver spontaneously. So if it's going to come on their own, let's make it. Let's work. Now, what you need to do is you need to make a V with your gloved hand. So as you'll have and you'll have your index and your birdie finger one and then your other finger and your pinky separated and that creates your V. All right. You want to make you want to position them at the vagina to keep the walls from compressing the fetus's airway. So you'll stick it right up next to the mother, create that V and you want to put that mouth and that nose between the V of your hand. What that does, it creates a gap space for that baby to take a deep breath. So this is complications. This is called a limb presentation. That baby's just in the wrong place. So the fetus with the limb presentation cannot be delivered in the field, and it must go to a hospital. That's all I'm going to tell you about that one. All right, so if you have a prolapse cord, um, if the umbilical comes out of the vagina before the fetus, that's a prolapsed. Do not push the cord back in. There's usually time to get the patient to the hospital at this point. Your job is just to try to keep the fetus's head from compressing the cord, period. Ask the mother. <clears throat> Here comes the fun part. You want to place the pregnant mom supine with the foot of the cot raised about 6 to 12 inches or high, it's well, higher than the head, basically. You want to elevate her uh, hips on a pillow as high as you want to elevate the best you can. Uh, you can ar alternately the woman between the knee to chest position and the kneeling and bent forward facing. Uh, just, I'm going to tell you, here's the easiest thing. Read the very last one. Transport fast go to the hospital so all i can tell you it's the easiest thing to do go in a hurry spina bifida is a developmental defect which the portion of the spinal cord or meanings may protrude outside of the vertebrae and possibly outside of the body when it protrudes outside of the body it is seen on a newborn's back and usually occurs in the lower third of the back and the lumbar down there near the booty cover cover the open area of the spinal cord with a sterile moist dressing immediately after birth make sure because you don't want that to be get infected because that can be fatal uh, maintenance of the newborn's body temperature is very 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 important because it's going to because uh, the moisture can lower the the newborn's body temperature, so keep that in mind. Um, have someone hold the newborn against his or her body if they're willing to. Uh, maybe the parent may be in denial, shock, or something else has happened. <sighs> Twins. That's just better to deliver in the hospital. Uh, I've not delivered anyone's in the field. I've oh, I've not heard of one. In a long time from some of the groups that I know, doesn't mean it's not going to happen to you. Twins are usually delivered within 30 minutes of each other. Uh, multiple fetuses are diagnosed early in pregnancy, so the mom's going to know. Uh, with multiple fetuses, prepare 
for more than one resuscitation and call for assistance just in case. Uh, one's going to be smaller than the other. That, that's not like it's going to be a big deal, but just be prepared. Consider this possibility of twins at any time the first newborn is small or the woman's abdomen remains fairly large. Just be ready. If twins are present, the second one will usually be born, oh, I'm sorry, within about 45 minutes of each other. About 10 minutes after the first birth, contractions will begin again, and the birth process repeats itself because they in their own little sack, they're ready to go. It's the same process, same everything. They get the same APGAR scale. You're going to do one natural delivery and another natural delivery, and you're going to rock on. Uh, normal term for twins is about, uh, will be about seven pounds ish. They're going to be about eight months. Uh, they're going, some of them's going to be tiny. Um, see the difference right here. They both look pissed off. You can't blame them. They in this nice, warm, cozy position. Somebody pissed them off and pulled them out into this horrible world. Got it. We know. We get it. We understand. We get pissed off every time we wake up. I got it. Premature newborns require special care to survive. Not all of them. Not all of them. A lot of them are pretty good. Now, if they are premature, uh, they some has been as small as a, a pound. And when they get that salt, they measure in ounces. They keep it that way so they can uh, situate their medicines a little bit easier in the hospital. Um, some post term. Oh, sorry, post terms. There we go. We're on my screen now. So. Uh, Let's see here. Just try to keep it as clean as possible. Um, if you're in a dirty environment, try to move that patient, mother, child, whatever you can, to a clean, dry environment. If you mean just moving them to the truck and to deliver in the back of your truck, that's cool. Um, you can you can dictate that. That's your decision, your call. Um, removing them from the location, 100% your call. You make it the best for you. Um, if you just don't feel comfortable delivering inside of a location, just say, hey, look, we're going to deliver here, but I would like to, you know, get out to my truck where I have better lighting. Whoops, sorry about that, y'all. I have better lighting. I can see things. I have all my tools there. That's okay. Just keep it clean, you know. Uh, fetal demis, uh, you may find yourself delivering a fetus who has passed in the woman's uterus before labor, unfortunately. The onset of labor may be premature, but labor will otherwise progress normally sometimes. The delivered fetus may have skin blisters, skin sloughing, and dark discoloration. The head's probably going to be soft and perhaps grossly deformed. Uh, do not attempt to resuscitate any obviously dead neonate. That's, that's really hard. Um, I, I don't, I just I wish that on nobody that they have to do that in their time, but just know everything's possible. And the, and the parents may not know or a traumatic event has happened and it's a delivery while you're in transport and maybe a long transport. Whoops, I think I, um, do you delivery without sterile supplies? Uh, if you're in an ambulance, you, you're required by, by state, every state to carry an OB kit. So, we're just going to skip that one. Postpartum complications. Uh, you want to massage them as much as you can to keep the bleeding. Um, if the bleeding is in excess of 500 milliliters, that's excessive. Uh, remember, if they bleed after the delivery of the placenta, you can start massaging upon the, the female's abdomen. Uh, apply some good direct pressure. Uh, and you can massage there, and it could take several minutes. Um, sometimes your technique may need to be adapted or your hand placements. Those may be some problems there. Uh, excessive bleeding after birth is usually caused by the muscles of the uterus not fully contracting. Nah, I got it. Cool. You may have some issues with delivery of more than one. Uh, a long labor, uh, and the uterus is they going to be tired too, bro. That uterus is like, nah, you're going to give me a minute. I'll get it going in a minute. We'll get this fixed, and that's what's going to happen. 
So once the body is able to recoup and go back, the bleeding should contract. You may have parts of the placenta that has torn off that is now located inside of the female, and that may be one of the, that may be the source of the bleeding. Um, but just note uh, when you start getting, you'll have a, a level that you'll get to that you'll be like, all right, that's a lie. I'm I'm done. Like we need this is serious. Let's let's get this over with. Um. So when once you're in route, once everything's done, you want to cover the vagina with a sterile pad. You still want to leave them undressed but covered. Uh, cover them with a sheet. Keep their modesty. Uh, if you happen to have any tissue that is passed from the vagina after the delivery of the placenta and all that, you need to keep that. The placenta should go in a bag of its own. That needs to be transported and taken to the facility also for them to do whatever they care to do with it. Uh, if possible, provide oxygen. Never hold a woman's leg together <laughs> and pack the vagina with gauze to try to control bleeding. It don't work like that, folks. It just it just don't work. It's not going to happen. I don't know what to tell you, but it don't work. Um, postpartum patients. Um, do suffer from pulmonary embolisms, and that is a result of a clot that travels through the bloodstream and becomes lodged in the pulmonary circulation, and that's blocking blood flow from the lungs, and that is going to be life-threatening. Y'all know what a PE is, so y'all can imagine that's going to happen in pregnancy and how much scarier that is also. If you deliver this baby in the field and the woman begins to start telling you, I'm having trouble breathing, I can't, I can't get my breath. Just think about a potential of a PE going on. Also, I want y'all to suspect a pulmonary embolism in patients of childbearing age with any respiratory complaints who have recently delivered a baby, especially with the sudden onset difficulty breathing in an altered mental status. If they say, hey, I delivered a baby a couple of days ago and now I'm having trouble breathing. Wait a minute, you said what? And you think automatically they're probably most likely having a PE. And surpri provide supplemental, I mean, sorry, provide supplemental care, comfort care, and, your, and continue with your ABCs all the way to the hospital. Keep their, keep their dignity. Uh, treat what they see is going on with them. If they're having problems, treat those problems. If they start having complaints, you can complete those plaints, complaints. Now, you should have ALS at this time because you potentially need an IV for fluids. Uh, I always like to have an eye, a line on my, my patients, uh, especially in delivery. So if you realize that you're going to be doing a delivery, you need to call for ALS fast, as fast as you can. Get that baby some ALS care. All right, folks, look at there. That is your test code. Uh, this is needed for you to finish your uh, test and your chapter. This is for chapter 33. Your code is 21 forward slash 8 and the at symbol. 21 forward slash 8 at symbol. Thank you all so much. I hope you all have a good evening. If you all have any questions, Please email them to me. Please don't try to Facebook me or anything else. I'm on vacation. So please send me an email and I will answer to you as the best that I can. Hope you have a wonderful time. I hope you all learn something from this. And you all have a fantastic rest of your day. See you all on the flip, you all.